know, once I was sitting on an aircraft and I have a lot of time on an airplane. And I had an atheist sitting next to me and we were talking about faith and he said, you guys are very bad. The Muslims, I said, no, you get good and bad in every faith. He said, not Islam. I'm saying, what do you mean? He said, Islam, everyone's bad. You believe in Quran? I said, yeah, Quran, we believe in Quran. He says, this Quran, it's got bad things in it. I said, what? He says, you know, it says that anyone who's not a Muslim is going to hellfire. That is very bad. You guys are filled with hatred. You guys, I said, brother, you don't believe in hellfire. Why are you worried? <laughs> That's the irony. Atheist, he doesn't believe in the hereafter. And he's telling me we are bad because we believe everyone's going to hell. I said, by the way, the Christians believe the same. The Jews believe the same. The Hindus believe the same. And most other faiths believe the same. What about them? He said, no, but they don't have a Quran. I said, okay, this is a bigot. This is a person who really doesn't know. He is so uneducated. He hasn't mixed. I learned more about other faiths and inclinations and different types of people. When I traveled the world, subhanallah. For some reason, there is dead silence here. Allahu Akbar. Let's hope that's not happening to us. The biggest deviation. Those innocent people are being accused by someone who claims to know the unseen. Do you know how they operate? I will tell you this evening in order to equip you with that knowledge. They have a link with the jinn sometimes. That too is prohibited. Allah says in the Quran, In Surah Al-Jinn, Allah speaks about it. Allah says, Part of the things that are mentioned, he says, and from amongst the issues that are taking place, there are people from mankind who are seeking assistance from those of jinn kind and those of jinn kind are leading them further astray. That's a Quranic verse. Open Surah Al-Jinn and read it. Ya ma'ashar al-jinn qad istakthartum min al-ins. I love that verse because it wakes us up. Oh, jinn kind, you have made enough fools out of mankind. Allahu Akbar. One of the translations of that verse. Oh, jinn kind, it's enough what you've done. You've already taken a lot of these people and hoodwinked them. So they would seek the assistance of a jinn who will immediately communicate with a Karin that is with you. Karin that is with you means when Allah created you, He created your soul and put it into a uniform known as your body. This uniform, you're going to take it out when you die and your, your soul will continue. I hope you understand the way I've worded it. Yours is the soul. Allah has created it. He put it into this uniform known as a body. When you die, you remove your uniform and the soul is gone. With that uniform, two other elements. There is an angelic angel, an angelic force, and there is a devil. That Karim from the jinn kind, he communicates immediately with that jinn of the man whom you went to go and see. And you know what? He says, this sister has a pinched nerve at the fourth, uh, uh, you know, vertebra at the bottom of her back. And it's in the left corner. If you are just to give her, for example, this piece of paper and tell her to take five roses and cut their petals into that which is not more than 0.01 grams and take 16 lemons and cut them into quarters and put them around those petals and take the piece of paper and burn it and push it into the center, then I will actually flick out that pinched nerve. So this man with a big beard, mashallah, pink turban that is as long as ever, mashallah, you know, huge item. And he tells you, say subhanallah. You say subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. Say alhamdulillah, say alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Right, now let me tell you what's wrong with you. You need to take this, these petals and these lemons and this piece and do this and do that. And you need to do everything together and you will be better. So you say, shukran, jazakumullah khair. You know, mashallah, this man did not take any money. Nothing happened. He took your iman. That's what he did. And sometimes he doesn't know because his diamond is also that Chinese one we spoke about. Subhanallah, it's a fact. So now what happens? You come and you do all that and suddenly you are better. You are better. Well, you will be better. Why? Because the devil has cured you. 
You stole your cure. The devil, the jinn knows exactly what happened. And the jinn knows exactly where you are standing. Subhanallah. So you were cured. Your back is cured. Mashallah. Now that man is a saint. Do you know that? And you send so many people to him. But Allah says, hang on. Do you know you can even earn money through stealing? Do you know that? You become an instant millionaire through robbery. But that does not make you a person who did something right. No. You will say, wow, I got the money. But it does not make you right. So you're saying, wow, I'm cured. But it does not make it right. You will be cured. But you suffer the consequence of it. What is the consequence? They will put a tag. They dangle something. The first thing they did, they will laugh at Allah and have insulted the messenger to say, ha, 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 ha. You told them to put their head, your, their head on the ground. We promised you we will deviate them. Here they are. They're ready to cut lemons and they're ready to put roses and they're ready to do things that made no sense for us, not for you. Do you know? They just took away your iman. They made you worship the devil and you don't even know. And you're happy. You're still saying, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May Allah grant us understanding. So now, they will tell you, do you know who did it? A member of your family did it. Why do they say that? Every time by default, that is the answer. Sometimes they will pinpoint a person's name. They will show you, look up into the wall. When you look up, you see a face. Wow. Hey. No, I'm not joking. I'm honest with you. You'll see a face. The face. Hey, that's my sister-in-law. Okay, right. I know. I know what happened. Wallahi, that was the jinn. That's all. What is the job of the jinn? To break your family ties. That's point number one. Go and read the hadith. Allah explains it through the blessed lips of that messenger whose mission was to show you how Allah wants to be worshipped. And here we are thinking, wow, you know what? This is true. I've seen it with my eyes. And then they tell you, no, you know what? Just read a lot of salah. Read a lot of salah. So in your heart, you're thinking, subhanallah, this cannot be wrong. The man is telling me to read Quran. He's telling me to read salah. But now I hate my sister. I hate my sister-in-law. I hate my mother. My mother is a witch and my auntie is a witch and everybody else is doing so much witchcraft and I am the person everybody's against me and everybody's bombarding me and nobody has done anything, nothing at all. There are innocent people whom you are accusing because you have worshipped the devil. Allahu Akbar. And we become so deep in it that we cannot do without it, my brothers and sisters. That's not how a Muslim should operate. Pray and keep praying. I have seen the power of prayer. It will deliver you from whatever you have been suffering from. Believe me. But you need to be constant. Maintain it. Turn to Allah. How can we want Allah to cure us when we are on the wrong page? Sometimes forget about the wrong page. We are in the wrong book altogether. Allahu Akbar. And we want Allah to cure us. What type of deviation is this? Wallahi, we should understand. If someone claims that X and Y did it, let me tell you. And I'm telling you because I know what I'm talking about. If that jinn was told you are lying, the jinn will change the name. If the jinn says, Abdullah did this to you, you say, you are lying. He says, okay, Abdurrahman did it to you. <laughs> say, no, you are lying. Okay, Fatima did it to you. You are lying. Okay, Khadija did it to you. That proves that the jinn is a liar. Allah says, the jinn is making fools of you, O oh man. And we are busy saying, no, he told the truth. Because you don't know how that man operated. The man who gave you the answer, you don't even know how he operated. But this is what they're doing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Can a man correct his Muslim woman colleagues on their appearance and their on for following pro proper ruling of Islam? For example, a man corrects a woman that her lipstick is too much. MashaAllah. My sister, what was he doing looking at that lipstick? MashaAllah. Uh, the reality is, if politely he reminds a Muslim sister, I don't think to say your lipstick is too much is actually respectful. To be honest with you, if I saw a sister you know, full makeup and whatever. The first thing I would do, inshallah, inshallah, I hope Allah strengthens me to just look down, you know. And uh, I'm being as realistic as possible, my brothers. You know, I'm trying to word it respectfully. Don't think that I'm a person who's not a human being. I'm just like you. So inshallah, I try my best to look down and I wouldn't embarrass that sister in that, in that condition. Not at all. It's the wrong time and place. Astaghfirullah. La hawla wa la billah. 
You know, Wallahi, what are you doing? You know, the woman will start hating religious people. What are these guys all about? No way. You get an opportunity. You find the right moment. You show them that you care for them as a Muslim sister. And she's not just an object. And slowly but surely, Wallahi, sometimes without speaking, it will start improving itself because they will realize that, hey, you know what? Hang on. I am not created by Allah to attract the opposite sex. And to be honest, I've spoken to non-Muslim women sometimes when the opportunity has arisen. And a lot of them feel, no, it's, it's, I feel good when all the men look at me. I get angry when a man don't look at me, man. You know, it happened to me once. We were in an airport in one of the European countries and I walked away, I walked past and there was this woman who was literally dressed to kill, you know. And subhanallah, by the help of Allah, and I'm, I'm relating it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we are human beings. I didn't even look. It didn't even tickle me. And she actually came up to me a little while later and say, why didn't you look? And I'm like, Astaghfirullah, now you want me to look basically, you know. <laughs> and I said, no, sister, I respect you so much that I'd, I'd appreciate, you know, and so on. And this has happened to me not a long time ago. And it's happened to other scholars in the past. And I've mentioned this in some of my, my, my lectures as well. So I think to correct a sister, there is a way, you know, a respectful way, a dignified way. But it is a duty to do something about it. You know, when you see something bad, you have to correct it. So when you correct it, you correct it on different levels, but you are never harsh. The Prophet ﷺ was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is because of the mercy of Allah that you are lenient towards them. Had you been harsh and hard-hearted towards them, they would have dispersed. Wallahi, the same rule applies. You see a Muslim and every one of us, myself included, we need correction. Imagine if someone comes to you and just starts telling you things and you know you're an idiot and you're useless and what you said and what you did and how you operate. You won't appreciate it because that's the nature of man. But if you want to correct someone, brother, mashallah, tabarakallah, you know, so on. And if it's a sister, you don't need to get into all that detail. But at least you need to show concern. Uh, sometimes when Muslims have Muslim colleagues who are of the opposite sex, they prefer to talk to non-Muslims than their own Muslims, you know, and this is something that beats me. I don't understand what's the logic behind it. I'm not saying you shouldn't be communicating with any of your colleagues, Muslim or non-Muslim, but I'm saying the poor sister is firstly a Muslim. Perhaps she looks up to you. I know of Muslim sisters who've been motivated at workplace just because their male colleagues never miss a salah. And the sister says, I had a male colleague who never ever missed his salah. And I was so embarrassed because I just used to sit through the lunch and do nothing. And then I started, I said to myself, if he does it, let me do it. And there was no communication. It was just looking. So this is why we say, subhanallah, there is a way of doing things. So uh, it is a duty of anyone, either one, to correct the other. But with respect and with, with wisdom. You know, we heard the verse beautifully recited earlier on. Udu'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. When you are calling towards the path of Allah, call with wisdom. Don't call with, uh, uh, you know, th the first thing that comes to your head. Sit, think about it, make dua to Allah about it, ask Allah's guidance about it. Then do something. You might want to send a beautiful email. And you know, when you send an email, there's a way of doing things. Because if you just send an email to the same sister who's working with you and say, Sister, uh, like the sister just said, you, 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 wear, you wear too much lipstick at, at work and that is haram as it is lipstick is red and the color of Jahannam is also red. <laughs> come on, come on. There's a way of talking. So you say, sister, mashallah, may Allah strengthen you, may Allah help you, may Allah bless you and your loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you goodness and greatness. I've got so many weaknesses of my own. Please highlight them if you see them. Please do not feel bad that I'm highlighting to you something minor that I believe, you know, it was, if it wasn't my duty as a Muslim, I wouldn't even have bothered. But I felt very, very slightly that I should perhaps let you know. And as I say, before I let you know, if there's anything that you see in me that needs attention, please let me know. And the, the point that I wanted to raise was, you know, perhaps if you'd like to consider uh, or, or reconsider the way you wear your makeup. Allahu Akbar, I'm trying to wear it carefully. This is just an example based on what the sister is saying. Or it is much more palatable. A person will take it, they'd say, Jazakumullah khair, I appreciate, make dua for me, I thank you, because of how you said it. This goes back to the way you talk. May Allah grant us goodness and wisdom, but it is our duty to correct one another. Wallahu a'lam. Sometimes it's a complex mind. I know, I recall learning the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu of a handshake. It's a nice, solid handshake. You know, you just below your thumb, this part here meets the same part of the other person. 
and it actually plugs in and you grip it and you shake it and you look at the face and you break into a little smile and you say assalamu alaikum that's the proper sunnah and then you have people giving you the two fingers have you seen that it's like they don't want to shake your hand at all where are they going to be loved by anyone you know, they just do this and next thing it's out. Shake it, shake it properly. Don't worry, the fungus on their hands is not going to come to you. <laughs> it's a fact. This is something he says, greet the people. That's what he said. He greeted with a smile. He, he was a person who used to smile often at the people such. And it is reported that he was absolutely free from hypocrisy. So much so that when he was sad, you could see it in his face. It wasn't hidden. He was sad. You could see I've just upset him because it was on his face. With us, we so hurt him. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you're there and you want to bash the person, but you haven't managed to say anything. Let them know, you know, sister, I'm hurt. What you said, what you did is bad. I'd rather sort out the mess than to let it grow as a hypocrite. Wallahi, we let the things grow like hypocrites. And the women are not the only ones. It's seeped into the men, honestly. We smile at each other and we hug each other and there's a dagger. You know, we're gone. I can imagine it. It happens. And these are plastic smiles that cause hatred in the ummah. Don't let it be. I'd rather confront a person who's a brother of mine. Brother, I love you. I care for you. You are a human being. You're a Muslim. You are my brother in faith. I really have a lot of respect for you. But I would just like to clarify this one point. It's a point that hurt me. Perhaps you have a clarification. They may not like it, but they will appreciate it long term. That was the messenger. Remember, the Prophet ﷺ joked even with his family members. How many of us, especially the older people, sit with our family members and tell them decent jokes? In Islam, when we say decent, it must not be X-rated, number one. It must never be about another race or color. Never. Haram. To totally prohibited. It must never ever be about another religion. Totally prohibited. The Quran prohibits you to joke about other religions. Don't ever mock and jeer and joke about others who are calling besides Allah, the gods besides Allah. Because in return, they might start joking about Allah and you were the cause of it. May Allah protect us all. So it is prohibited. Look at how beautiful these teachings of social conduct are. They make cartoons. We will never make cartoons. Never. Not even about their gods. You cannot attack fire with fire. And here in Islam, we are being taught that even the Prophet ﷺ shared lighter moments with his companion. So many times we have narrations where they say the Prophet ﷺ laughed until his back teeth, the molars were showing. Subhanallah. I, that is a broad smile, very broad smile. Some narrations say the canines were showing. That's also a very broad smile. But when he laughed, there was a method of laughing. That is also part of our social conduct. You don't laugh in such a way that your belly goes up and down, up and down, and there is an earthquake-like feeling in the room. <laughs> Laughter is according to what it has to be. That's it. That's your social conduct. Because when you laugh so much, let me tell you what happened. If everything is a joke, even when you joke every few minutes, there might be some who do that, because I have certain friends who do do that. People will not take you seriously in anything in life. That is the result of it. And who caused it? You caused it. Why? You want to convert everything into a joke? So that means even when you are serious, people will say, take him lightly, you know, not a pinch of salt, a whole bag. So the Prophet ﷺ joked, it's part of his character and conduct. He shared light moments. But the question is for me and you, how many of us do do that with those who are closest to us? I know of certain people being a counselor myself, when we counsel people for their problems and what they have within the homes and so on, there are people who will spend hours on end talking to their friends and joking and laughing. They come home, they cannot share one single joke with the poor wife who is sitting there with a prepared meal waiting for the last two hours. Not even one. And yet they were enjoying, they know it in their hearts and minds, and the poor wife is probably even doubting where he was. اقرأ كتاب الله ترق جنانه وتن العظيم الأجر والغفران رتله روي القلب
من نفحاته كالماء يروي لهفة العطشان